Hello people, welcome to the History of Sexuality Volume 2 course. This is an exclusive course for those supporting the Critique with Nietzsche and Foucault project. Thanks to you, I can dedicate myself to being a teacher, which is one of my great passions. And in addition, I can teach about issues that are very important to me and are part of my life and the way I came to understand that they are very relevant knowledge for our days. I can also, thanks to you who take courses, continue to produce free content on YouTube and other platforms and thus reach more people. I believe that everyone should benefit from this project and some like you who feel the need to go deeper can do it at the same time that you also manage to give me the support I need to be able to benefit other people too. Everyone wins. This first uh, video class in English only uh, on the History of Sexuality Volume 2 I am making available for free because we still don't have uh, uh, students, international students on this course. The Brazilian class in Portuguese already has 10 students and we have started. So I am making this first introductory class to the Volume 2 free so that some people may be more interested in joining uh, classes. Uh, those of you who support on the website patreon.com and you become a multiplier supporter, the link will be here in the description of the video. Those of you who become multiplier supporters, in, uh, besides having access to the weekly video lessons, uh, you will have complementary materials and you will have a live chat with me where I will be able to hear you, talk to you, see you and other students we will have group live video chats once a month where we can talk about the history of sexuality course that's going on and anything else about Foucault or Nietzsche that you want to talk about as well. The course of volume one of the history of sexuality is in the format of six video lessons available on our YouTube channel. Here, in addition to video lessons, I will also make available to you complementary materials and also live meetings of students with me where you can ask questions and still see and hear each other and also talk to each other. In this way, everyone learns more because they learn novelties with each other. We are going to hold at least one online meeting every month just for you students who, as supporters of this project, allow me to donate more time and create more branches out of this. So I thank you immensely for entering into this journey with me and suggestions are always welcome. Without further ado, let's start today's lesson on the introduction to the book History of Sexuality, Volume 2, The Use of Pleasure. First, uh, some directives about the classes. It's important to note that I will always do a class that follows a very close reading of the books. This means that I try to stick to the maximum that I can to the order of the pages of the text and I will rarely add another part that comes too much later in the text. So I follow the text proper most of the time. And of course, the class is a selection of excerpts from the text and comments I make to make some points clearer, those points that I believe are important. Reading, of course, is fundamental. And if you find points that I didn't touch upon or that you need to know more about, you can bring them to our live online meetings where I'll seek to answer your questions there. Right at the first sentence of the introduction, Foucault explains that the History of Sexuality series is being published much later than he thought, and he will explain why. I already mentioned this in Volume 1 video lessons, but now Foucault will detail where his study took him. He explains that he was not seeking to carry out a history of sexual behaviors, uh, 
or a history of sexual practices. Because that would be to realize a history of how some practices were born or changed, and it would also imply understanding that these practices would be univocal, would be objects identical to themselves, even with the passage of time, even with a cultural change. A history of practices would be have to cross very different times and cultures, and as if to understand these practices as objects in the most positivist and objectivist sense that can be given to the term object. As if the practices were eternal entities which preserved their identity no matter how much they changed. Foucault is well aware of the dangers of this history of behaviors and he has already critiqued this idea of sex as a universal object, as a natural object that would run through history in volume 1. On the other hand, Foucault also says that he did not want to make a history of representations. A history of representations would also have to be based on sex as a universal. For representations, ideas about sex as, a, as the basis of a history would be the history of ideas, would be the history of changes in representations that happen while the sex as an object would be the same, it would not change. This way of dealing with sex as a natural, as a universal, Foucault also showed in volume one, which is just, uh, he showed it to just be another established way of thinking, established in the 19th century by the sciences of sex and the way they formed a discourse on sex. What Foucault wants to study is sexuality. But also in volume one, he already, already showed that sexuality is neither a universal nor a natural object. That the discourse about sexuality as natural or universal is linked to institutional practices such as the clinical ear, that which was the way of listening to the so-called degenerates, the perverts, uh, those that were considered abnormal. And from that, the study of the other considered abnormal is that a science of sex has been created which is intended to establish normality and naturalness of sexuality. The sciences of sex of the 19th century, in turn, inherited the practice of clinical listening from the practice of Christian confession. The other was listened to in order to intervene on this other, to judge that other within moral schemes in Christian culture and schemes of representation of established power knowledge in the science of sex. That is to say that far from being just a scientific progress or from producing neutral knowledge about the human being, the sciences of sex, which, according to Foucault, are the prehistory of psychologies, of psychiatry, they are born already loaded with values. When the term sexuality was born in the beginning of the 19th century, it was born full of history. The dominant way of talking about sexuality, even today, is that sexuality is repressed, that it is a historical constant, and that the prohibitions, interdictions that are placed on sexuality are historical, but sexuality isn't. Sexuality would, would be this natural fact of the human being that goes throughout history. Foucault went on to show in volume one that this very discourse of sexuality as fundamentally repressed is part of the very apparatus of sexuality. That saying that sexuality is natural, universal, and that we only need to free it is part of the truth games of sexuality, of the apparatus of sexuality itself that have been operating at least since the 19th century. In this discourse, if sex or sexuality changes, it would be for account of interdictions, prohibitions, repression, 
the so-called by Foucault repressive hypothesis. About the repressive hypothesis, or this way of thinking about sexuality, which was dominant in the 19th century and which is still very strong today, says Foucault. It is equivalent to placing the desire and the subject of desire outside the historical field and making the general form of the prohibition account for what may be historical in sexuality. In other words, the dominant way of talking about sexuality presupposes that sex and sexuality are historical constants, they come from nature, so the desire and the subject of desire are not problematized in this dominant discourse even today, which is part of our apparatus of sexuality since the 19th century. If you still don't understand what the apparatus of sexuality is, you need to study volume 1 because this is very important, together with Foucault's conception of power that he brings there in volume 1, to understand why we cannot quietly accept the ideas that sex and sexuality are universal facts of nature, or that we have to discover our truth through sexuality. Because declaring your truth can be precisely what imprisons you, not only within the apparatus of sexuality, but in others as well, and what reproduces the dominant forms of power knowledge. Identity is a practice, but we need to use it strategically so as not to be reduced in our possibilities of life by our identities. Seeking your truest truth can open paths, but it can also be a path to a demoted and demeaning life for you and others, because we can become inspectors of the truth. Foucault saw the liberating potential of the struggles of homosexuals, for example, like himself and others, but at the same time he also saw the super signifying of sex, in the search for the truth of the subject as a mean of subjecting subjects. So taking sex as your truth could be your prison. But here in volume two, Foucault will go back more, more back in time. He will explain that what he planned to do is, citation, a history of the experience of sexuality, where experience is understood as the correlation in a culture between fields of knowledge, types of normativity, and forms of subjectivity. So let's see here. Experience of sexuality is not an inner subjective experience. Quite the opposite. The forms of subjectivity that Foucault talks about are just one of the spaces of this experience and which is crossed by knowledge and power, by the rules that circulate in society, by the norms. You already have an indication here that for Foucault, the experience is not psychological, it's not individual in the sense that each one has an experience, but that we cannot understand sexuality without combining the social and the subjective. Foucault will speak on the three axes that are necessary to understand sexuality. They are, first, the formation of sciences or knowledges that refer to sex sexuality. Second, the systems of power that regulate their practice. Third, and the ways in which individuals can and should recognize themselves as subjects of this sexuality. And he will say that on the first two axes he had already worked a lot on, which are the axes of knowledge and power. The third axis would be in this work to study the notion of desire or desiring subject. Foucault says that studying the historical correlations of knowledge, the analysis of discursive practices, and the analysis of power relations and their technologies, he had already done all of this in other, other previous studies, so he already had the instruments to carry out a history of sexuality. But there was a third axis, that of subjectivity, that would be a new axis of this work, and that is precisely what differentiates volume two from the rest 
of Foucault's studies, although even in earlier works he had always taken into account the subjective uh, part uh, of relations as well. But he had not done this in the way he's doing it in this work. On this issue of having already worked a lot with the discursive practices and with the relations and technologies of power, he comments, but when I came to study the modes according to which individuals are given to recognize themselves as sexual subjects, the problems were much greater. At the same time, the notion of desire or that of the desiring subject constitutes, if not a theory, then at least a generally accepted theoretical theme. This very acceptance was odd. It was, it was the same theme, in fact, or variance thereof, that was found not only at the very center of the traditional theory, but also in the conceptions that sought to detach themselves from it. It was this theme, too, that appeared to have been inherited in the 19th and 20th centuries from a long Christian tradition. While the experience of sexuality as a singular historical figure is perhaps quite distinct from the Christian experience of the flesh, both appear to be dominated by the principle of the desiring man. In any case, it seemed difficult to analyze the formation and development of the experience of sexuality from the 18th century without doing in relation to desire and the desiring subject a historical and critical work. In other words, without undertaking a genealogy. So here Foucault says he's making a genealogy. I'm not going to delve into what genealogy is here because it would be a long, long discussion. About that, I made a video on the YouTube channel and I will drop the link here for you. It's important to know that genealogy is not just a work on history, at least not in the sense that history receives in the scientific or pedagogical environment or in the legal environment. In other words, in the dominant means of understanding what history is as a univocal, as an indisputable fact, as a continuous history, as Foucault says. The genealogist makes a history of truth. So the truths about history itself, we can make a genealogy of them. There is no neutral point. There is no final genealogy. There is no last word the complete and final history on any subject, because we have no access to reality except through language, knowledge, power, and our own subjectivity. It's from inside and not from outside reality that genealogy is made. To do genealogy is to be necessarily involved in the study you do. We don't accept that you can be totally objective uh, that everything is just, or that everything is just subjective, on the other hand. Neither one nor the other. In fact, being in a very close relation with your own training as a subject, scrutinizing your training as a subject is fundamental to becoming a good genealogist. As subjects form, formed with, within the Christian tradition, even if it's only the secular part of that tradition, we have a close relationship with this issue of desire and the subject of desire. And here in the history of sexuality, Foucault will take us on a journey where we can see ourselves, but in a different way. It's not leading us to see who we really are, but what happens when we say who we are and thereby making us think again about who we are and what we can be. It shows changes in history, and those changes, these ways of being, can affect the way we think and live today. But this depends on us and our reading and application of what, of what we learn. He doesn't give us the way, he only indicates possibilities. In a way of Nietzsche, the way needs to be done by each one. Everyone makes their own path. Says Foucault. 
In short, the idea was to research in this genealogy how individuals were led to exercise on themselves and on others a hermeneutics of the desire to which sexual behavior of these individuals undoubtedly gave occasion, but certainly not the ex exclusive domain. In short, in order to understand how the modern individual could experience himself as a subject of a sexuality, it would be indispensable to first distinguish the way in which, for centuries, Western man had been led to recognize himself as a subject of desire. In other words, a hermeneutics, a constant analysis and interpretation of desire is a practice produced historically. The practice of analyzing and interpreting desire has led Western man to recognize himself as a, as a subject of desire. In other words, Foucault already makes it clear that there is nothing natural about being a subject of desire, that this subject had to be produced by a specific culture, and it is this genealogy that he will present to us as a chapter in the history of truth, a history of truth games. He will study the truth games and their relations with techniques of self or practices of self, the ways in which subjects constitute themselves as subjects are always in relation to truth games and relations of power. He will do this history of the subject or the subject of desire. The question that Foucault asks is, what were the truth games by which human beings came to see themselves as subjects of desire? In asking this question, Foucault does not pretend to have an objective answer. He makes it clear that his work is based on historical documents, but it's not the work of a historian. It's a work in the style of a philosophical essay. A philosophical essay aims to become an exercise, an asceticism, an exercise on oneself in the activity of thought, to try to think differently, to open thinking to new possibilities, and with that also to give new ways of living some possibility. And his way of understanding his work has everything to do with uh, some philosophical practices which place the task of philosophy as the task of practicing a way of life and of reflection of the exercise of ways of life, of a moral that does not is not only about rules and laws, but also about the way in which subjects behave before rules and laws, how they produce themselves where rules and laws do not become, they don't come first, but rather uh, a relation develops between themselves and these rules and laws. I quote Foucault again from the introduction. It seemed to me, therefore, that the question that ought to guide my inquiry was the following. How, why, and in what forms was sexuality constituted as a moral domain? Why is this ethical concern that was so persistent despite its varying forms and intensity? Why this problematization? But after all, this was the proper task of a history of thought as opposed to the history of behaviors or representations to define the conditions in which human beings problematize what they are and what they do and the world in which they live. But in raising this very, very general question and in directing it to Greek and Greek-Latin culture, it occurred to me that this problematization was related to a set of practices that certainly had considerable importance in our societies. I am referring to what might be called the arts of existence. What I mean by the phrase are those intentional and voluntary actions by which men not only set themselves rules of conduct, but also seek to transform themselves, to change themselves in their singular being, and to make their life into an oeuvre that bears certain aesthetic values and meets certain stylistic criteria.
these arts of existence, these tex techniques of the self, undoubtedly lost a certain part of their importance and their autonomy when they were assimilated into the exercise of a pastoral power in Christianity and later in practices of an educational, medical or psychological types. In any case, it seemed to me that the study of the problematization of sexual behavior in anti antiquity could be considered as a chapter, one of the first chapters of this general history of the techniques of the self. Here, Foucault makes it clear what he's going to do, which is this history of truth, this history of thought, history of subjectivity, history of the techniques of the self. It's all that. This opening to a history of subjectivity and truth, Nietzsche had already accomplished, but Foucault goes much further in the sense of detail in looking at specific times and cultures. Nietzsche looked only at his time and cast some looks of historicity where previously it was thought that there were essences like the subject or the truth. Foucault continues, I worked on this project whose goal is a history of truth. It was a matter of analyzing not behaviors or ideas, nor societies and their ideologies, but the problematizations through which being offers itself to be necessarily thought and the practices on the basis of which these problematizations are formed. The way in which Foucault will conduct his work is directly informed by his previous works. He does an archaeology because he looks for problematizations, he looks for a field of references that shows that there was a certain dominance of statements, of discursive practices, by which thought will work on being, on the self, and at the same time practices, technologies and power relations that are the basis of these problematizations. But this work is now different in the chronological sense from the pre previous ones because Foucault here brings up the question, the issues of the practices or techniques of self. So Foucault begins to show the forms of problematization in section 2 of the introduction. He will first make it clear that classical Greek or Latin antiquity were not entirely different from Christian, later Christian culture. Many themes dear to Christianity were already present at that time. There was already fear in relation to sex, the harmful potential of sex. But that does not mean, of course, that everyone thought the past in the same way. We cannot say how everyone thought. What Foucault did was to seek documents that prescribed ways of relating to sex and to oneself. If everyone thought or lived the same, there would be no need for prescriptions, exercises, rules being placed. But in addition to the fear of the danger of sex, there was also the ideal of fidelity expressed for the marital relationship. There was also a certain aversion to sexual behavior or the aesthetics uh, of young men who related themselves to other young men. And we know that the term homosexual is from the 19th century only, so you know we already talked about this in volume 1. There were already certain forms of stigmatization of sexual behavior or gender in antiquity, and there was also the prescription of abstaining from sex. These four prescriptions or problematizations, however, worked in very different con contexts from the current, current context and they were practiced quite differently, as we will see in the chapters of the book. But there are different problematizations, different ways of problematizing the same themes that Christianity came to problematize as well, with different objectives, within different strategies. Foucault already gives examples in the introduction, but I will leave this to speak on 
these examples in the chapters uh, when Foucault details them much better. He will show how the theme of the relation between sexual abstention and access to truth, uh, how abstaining from sex would be a path to truth, how this changes, this changes from ancient Greeks to Christianity. You then have in history both continuity and discontinuity. But, says Foucault, it would be a mistake to infer that the sexual morality of Christianity and that of paganism form a continuity. He says this because they are different formats of problematization based on different practices of self and different power relations in relation to communities. Foucault continues, various themes, principles and notions can perfectly be found in one and the other he means antiquity and Christianity. However, they do not have the same place and the same value in both. It's interesting to note here uh, something that Foucault is going to do a lot in the entire history of sexuality. He describes problematizations, that is the knowledges of classical antiquity, as well as its practices, and uh, now and then in comparison to Christian uh, knowledges and practices, but he does not necessarily mention Christianity all the time as his comparison. We can read Christianity or the West as comparison in various ways. This is because sometimes what he says uh, has already extrapolated Christianity. It has become part of a secularized Western culture, which even sometimes denies that aspect uh, of being, acting, or feeling uh, originating in Christianity itself. I mean, secularized Christian culture sometimes negates its own origins in Christianity, uh, its own ways of thinking, being, acting, feeling. Uh, Foucault is really making a genealogy here because his interest, in addition to realizing new possibilities of, of thought and ways of life for himself, is also to make us think with him about this. And so, if in our cultural milieu Christianity is dominant as a cultural form, as a means in which we were socialized, again, even if in a culture of secular, secularized Christianity, the comparisons he makes help us to see ourselves differently. Christianity works on morality as mandatory and compulsory and organizes its rules within codes that are monitored, charged directly to people. To be a Christian, you need to abide by certain rules. But if you're a secular Christian, you may still abide by those rules, but because you produce your own moral, you reproduce your own morality as well. In classical antiquity, on the other hand, there was no center for the production and enforcement of rules. These moral norms were not tabulated in universal rules. Ethics, this ancient uh, self-practice, this practice of the self, was prescribed for free men, not for women or slaves. So Foucault is not looking for a way of life to, to uh, model himself by, uh, because first, the aesthetics of Greek existence was not universal at all, and second, it was part of a very patriarchal and slavery culture. It's not a matter of looking for models. Foucault makes it very clear that this thing of trying to find models in other cultures is very problematic. In this book, Foucault is very attentive to ethical issues specific to the reality in which these people lived, to the problematizations they made and the relations these problematizations with others and with practices of self to self had. So far from looking for models, Foucault wants to understand specific relations, but he cannot fail to make a comparison with Christianity because it is through Christianity that these practices 
will undergo changes in history. And it's also through Christianity that we as Western, Westerners were socialized to think about the issues raised by ancient Greeks about the body, about marital relations, about sexual relations between men, for example, and about truth. So about these relations, says Foucault, the ancient Greeks created an austere style in their use of pleasure. In this study, Foucault will try to find the reasons for this austerity, this care in dealing with pleasures in order to form oneself as a subject. Foucault thus defines the eth ethical subject, the one who will transform himself as, citation, a process by which the subject circumscribes the part of himself that constitutes the object of this moral practice, defines his position in relation to the precept he respects, establishes for himself a certain way of being that will count as a moral achievement of himself, and to this end acts on, on himself, seeks to know himself, control himself, puts himself to the test, improves himself, transforms himself. In other words, here we are talking about what Foucault called techniques of the self. They are techniques for the production of subjects, but where the subjects themselves have an active part. It's not just a matter of being subject to a law, a norm, but rather an action of themselves on themselves, often aiming at power, wisdom, in short, objectives that can be prescribed by others, but where the subject has a fundamental, active role in this self-production. So Foucault makes it clear that he is not going to make a history of moral behaviors, nor a history of moral codes, or moral laws or rules, but rather, he says, citation, a history of ethics and ascetics understood as a history of the forms of moral subjectivation and the, the practices of self that are meant to ensure it. With this, Foucault shows that there are other ways of dealing with morals, not only in the Christian way of codes, infractions and penalties. There are ways that don't need authorities to make the morals be practiced. They don't need the fear of being punished for the subject to behave. Foucault says that it would be incorrect to say that Christian moralities, and he speaks here in the plural, can be reduced to this form of the codes, infractions, and penalties. Although, as he himself showed in other works, it appeared many times in this form, says Foucault. These ethics-oriented moralities, which do not necessarily correspond to those involving ascetic denial, have been very important in Christianity, functioning alongside code-oriented moralities. Between the two types, there were, at different times, juxtapositions, rivalries, and conflicts, and compromises. See, then, that Foucault doesn't reduce Christian morality to one type. He says that there were also forms of morality that did not depend on codes or penalties in Christianity. The difference, he notes, is that in Greco-Roman antiquity, the orientation was much greater for practices of the self in relation to moral conceptions. Instead of strict rules about what's allowed, what's prohibited, it was through asceticism, through self-exercise on oneself, that one tried to live an exemplary life, with practical effects that we will see in this book. I want to end this first lesson of the introduction with this description by Foucault about what this moral practice would be, or this ethical subject in ancient Greek that he will analyze in the book. Citation. The accent was placed on the relationship with the self that enabled a person not to be carried away by the appetites and pleasures, to maintain a mastery and superiority over them, to keep his senses in a state of tranquility, to remain free from interior bondage 
to passions, and to achieve a mode of being that could be defined by the full enjoyment of oneself, or the perfect supremacy of oneself over oneself. In other words, Foucault will lead us to know the use of pleasures by the ancient Greeks. Are you ready? This I see as a travel in time without leaving our time. We go with Foucault to rethink ourselves and the world we live in. In the next class, for supporters only on Patreon, we will go to chapter 1. In order to access the next class, you have to be a multiplier patron on the website Patreon. And then if you have any questions, write them down. Uh, after the next class, we will have our first live class where people can talk to each other, the students can talk to each other, we can talk about the issues that come up, the doubts, everything. This video I'm making available so that we have uh, international students coming to the course. We don't have any international students yet. Uh, the Brazilian class already has 10 students and we have started. So I'm hoping that with this first free, free class, uh, more people will join and we will have a first international class of the history of sexuality and then we will have other courses like volume 3, 4 and courses on Nietzsche that the students will choose for later this year. So have a happy reading. I hope you subscribe to the channel. I hope you also become a Patreon on Patreon and you're welcome to become uh, my student and have a happy reading and see you next week.